we're going to begin? Hello, everybody. Thanks for coming today. My name is Dean Bolivar. I'm the agricultural agent for UW Extension here in Door County, and I also cover Kiwani County. I worked with Bill Shoes here to put together a distinguished list of panelists today that are here. We have Tim Allen from the Department of Ag Trade and Consumer Protection. Would you please stand up? These are your resources, so I want to point them out. This is Brooke Senna. In the back, we have Bill Ruff, our Door County forester here. You want to raise your hand? Everybody's kind of looking back there. Next to him is Chris Bolzak. He's another forester for the DNR here in Door County. And let's see, did I forget anybody else? Anybody else here representing the state of Wisconsin besides? Oh, Tracy Salisbury is in back. She's our urban, urban forester. Our urban forester representative. And then we have Linda Williams, who's going to speak to you today. She's in back there. She's going to be doing most of the speaking. But the reason why I wanted to point these people out are these are the resources for you to go to if you have questions. So if you have questions today, we're going to have a question and answer period when we're all done with the presentation. And you're all going to answer your questions about what you need to know and what you hope to get answered today. So with that, I'm going to introduce Linda Williams. And let's thank her for coming today and giving this talk. microphone. You should use the microphone for right. camera purposes, please. Right, which is this one, correct? Yes. Okay. Anyone else? Should I use the regular microphone for the facility? It's not turned on. Yeah. Yes, yes? I'm hearing some yes. It's not turned on. It's turned on somewhere. Okay. Is this any better? No. There we go. How about if I move it like this? Better? Okay. Actually, you know what? I'm just going to hold it. And then, yes, I need to speak in the general area of this mic as well. OK. So um, I'm Linda Williams. I am the forest health specialist with the Department of Natural Resources. I work out of the Green Bay office and cover the northeastern part of Wisconsin. I currently cover 13 counties in the northeastern part of the state. I cover insect and disease issues with, uh, related to forest health and how they impact trees. And today we're going to be covering emerald ash borer. I'm not really going to be covering any of the other multitude of issues that can affect trees. So we're just going to focus on emerald ash borer. I am going to cover some basic information like biology, um, some information about where it is, the information about quarantines, and then some information about management. What can you do about it? What should you do about it? And what don't you have to do about it? So we'll cover all of that information. We will have a question and answer session at the end. And, um, and we'll be able to answer questions related to uh, the quarantines that DATCAP can handle, any of our forest management guidelines that our foresters can handle. Hopefully, we'll be able to answer whatever questions you guys have. Can I just see a quick show of hands? Who is here from? Um, an official standpoint, a, a, a county, a township, a municipality. Can I just see some show? Okay, all right, excellent. How many of you in the audience are landowners with more than five acres of forested land? Show of hands, okay, excellent, all right. How many of you are here just as a, a homeowner? You have maybe some ash in your yard? Show of hands, okay, well, good, all right. Anyone here um, as, a, as a business, maybe a firewood dealer, a tree care company, um, a logger, um, lumber mill, couple? OK, OK, excellent. So we have a wide range of folks out in the audience. Hopefully, we'll cover all of the information that all of you need. But in case we don't, there's that question and answer session at the end. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, Emerald ash borer is something that was introduced in 2002, well, I shouldn't say that. We first identified it in 2002 in southeastern United States. Let me see if I can get my mouse here. Right down here, southeastern Michigan, uh, right down here. And it had probably been in southeastern Michigan for at least 10 years by the time that it was actually identified when it was already killing ash trees in a fairly large area. By the time it was identified, it had already spread uh, an, to a number of areas, and we just really didn't know about it. Emerald ash borer lives under the bark of trees. It's relatively easy to spread it without even knowing it. 
So by the time we identified Emerald Ash Borer in Michigan, it had already been spread to quite a number of areas, and it took us a while to find some of those areas. This map is from June 2nd. This is the latest um, nationwide map that I could find. And all of the red dots are areas where we know we have Emerald Ash Borer infestations. The lower peninsula of Michigan is, quite frankly, generally infested. It's pretty much all over there. So there's just a random collection of red dots. Um, showing that it's generally infested. <clears throat> the rest of the country, all of those red dots are specific locations. And you'll see that, whoops, back. And you'll see that it's even made it all the way out here to Colorado. And the way that it made it out there is someone from out east went out camping in Colorado and they took their firewood with them. And the firewood happened to be infested and that's how emerald ash borer got out to Colorado. So emerald ash borer is very easily transported by people. It doesn't spread so quickly by itself, but we spread it really quickly and easily, and we're spreading it around the nation. One of the questions that I've been getting in the latest uh, emerald ash borer presentations that I've been giving is about this past winter and the bitter cold that we had. And the question is, will the cold kill all of the emerald ash borer? The short answer is no. The longer answer is, where they're native to, which is Asia, it gets cold there as well. They are a cold, hardy insect. They are also protected under the bark of the trees because they live under the bark for most of their life. And so wind chill means absolutely nothing. So all of those days this past winter when the schools were canceled because the wind chills were bitterly cold, the emerald ash borer didn't really care about those. And air temperatures are not necessarily the same as the temperatures underneath the bark. Uh, temperatures underneath the bark are often just a, a little bit warmer, and that little bit of a difference can make a huge difference in whether that insect lives or dies. So they're a little bit more protected under the bark, and although it was a bitterly cold winter in many areas of the state, it really wasn't that big of a deal to emerald ash borer. Now, many of the emerald ash borer probably did die, because it was a bitterly cold winter but the populations will rebound. So an example that I give, if we started the winter, if we went into winter with 100 emerald ash borer on a tree, and we had our severe winter, and we got 90% mortality, which is pretty darn good mortality. So we're left with only 10 emerald ash borer because we had 90% mortality. If half of those emerald ash borer are males, and half of those emerald ash borer are females, each female will lay about 40 eggs, a minimum of 40 eggs, so even if we only get the minimum of 40 eggs, if all of five of those females lay 40 eggs each, you've got a minimum of 200 emerald ash borer instantly gonna be laid on that, on that tree this spring. So we've already made up for what we lost over the winter. So even if we had a phenomenal die off this past winter, it wasn't quite enough to get rid of emerald ash borer. So this is the life cycle of emerald ash borer. The adult beetle is quite small go. Um, it fits on a penny quite nicely. It's a little bit less than half an inch long and it's slender. I do have some samples up there showing the the emerald ash borer adult and larvae that you guys can take a look at at the end of the the end of the session so you can see how big they aren't because they're really quite small. They are a fabulous green color as you can see in the upper right hand corner. They are a nice metallic color but they are small so although they are a fabulous color they're actually quite hard to spot. The eggs are tiny, absolutely tiny, and they are laid singly in the uh, cracks and crevices of the bark of the tree. So the adult will lay each egg singly, and she can lay it on, uh, she can lay 40 eggs on 40 different trees if she wants. Typically, they'll lay all their eggs on a single tree or maybe a couple of trees, but the eggs will hatch, and the little larvae is a, a flattened worm type thing that lives under the bark and winds its way back and forth, feeding in the cambium layer. The cambium layer is the layer of the tree that moves food and water. And so when that layer is damaged, uh, it does a significant amount of damage to the tree, cutting off food and water um, transport and killing the tree. Once the, once the larvae has completed its development, which can take one or two years, depending on the timing that the eggs are laid and hatch and the health of the tree, they will then pupate under the bark, and then the following spring into summer, they will emerge as adults. The adults are usually emerging between May and August. You might get a few that come out early, you might get a few that come out late, but the vast majority of them are going to emerge from May through August. And they'll mate and lay eggs and 
Once they've laid their eggs, they can die. These are some of the signs and symptoms that you'll typically see with trees that are infested by emerald ash borer. You'll see general decline of the crown. You might see epicormic sprouting, which is this sprouting of new stems along the base of the tree. You might also get epicormic sprouting from the very base of the tree, so it looks like it has a little shrub growing at the base of it, but those are all ash sprouts. And that's the tree's last gasp effort to survive. So the overall crown of the tree is declining, but it tries to send out some kind of leaves to keep itself alive. If you go up to that tree and look more closely, you might see some cracks in the bark. You may not, but you might see some cracks in the bark. And if you look at those cracks, you may see some tunneling underneath. If you peel the bark at that point, you'll see S-shaped tunnels. These galleries underneath the bark will wind back and forth in an S shape. They start out small because the larvae are small. They get larger as the larvae grows. You might actually find the larvae, which again is kind of a flattened worm type critter. Or you might find the adults as they're trying to chew their way out of the wood. You may also notice D-shaped exit holes. That's a capital D. They're flattened on one side and they're U-shaped on the other. That flattened part can be in any direction, up, down, left, right, it doesn't matter as long as they get out of the tree. They don't care which way they come out of the tree. But it will have a flat part on one side because that's the shape of the beetle. They're flat on top and they have a rounded underbelly. So they, they chew a hole that's exactly their size and shape so that they can get out. There's nothing else on ash that makes D-shaped exit holes that are just a touch under a quarter of an inch in size. There's nothing else on ash that will do that. You might also notice woodpecker damage on these trees. And by woodpecker damage, I'm not talking about the holes that woodpeckers can create when they're making a nest in a tree. I'm talking about the damage that woodpeckers create when they're going after a food source in a tree. So they're flecking off the outer layers of the bark to try and get at the larvae that are living underneath that bark. And it gives the tree kind of a blonde appearance because they've flecked off the outer layers of that dark colored bark. But oftentimes, the number one thing that people will notice as far as emerald ash borer symptoms is simply crown decline because they're, they're not looking at their tree particularly closely or they're driving past trees. And so they're, they're not gonna notice a tiny quarter inch, quarter inch D-shaped exit hole. You know, they're not gonna notice a little crack in the bark until they walk up to that tree more closely. So a lot of times people will notice that, oh, my tree is, my tree is declining. A lot of times they don't notice it's declining until it gets to this point, like the picture on the right hand side. That's 70% crown yeah. decline. That's significant decline in that tree. And I'm gonna talk a little bit later about treating a tree with insecticides. And they typically recommend that if your tree has more than 40% crown decline, you don't, don't bother treating it because it's too far gone. So a lot of times, like I just said, people will, I can't get my mouse to work, there we go. People will not notice that anything is wrong with their tree until it looks like this picture on the right hand side. And that tree is 70% gone and probably too far gone to, to really be able to bring back easily. The other thing that can be spotted from a distance or from just you know driving around, um, maybe as you're sitting in your house and looking out at your trees, you might notice it, is that woodpecker damage that I mentioned. Both of these trees are uh, severely woodpecker flecked, which is that removing of the outer layers of the bark, gives a tree that blonde appearance. Uh, it may be just in smaller patches up and down the tree. Emerald ash borer will start infesting the tree at the very top and work its way slowly downwards as the tree declines and dies, it will be able to attack lower and lower on the tree. And so the woodpeckers will start often at the top, but you may see woodpecker damage all the way up and down the tree because emerald ash borer will eventually infest the entire tree top to bottom. A lot of our native ash borers that we have will only in infest maybe the branches um, or a small area of the tree. And so woodpeckers will only focus on a very small area of the tree as opposed to the entire tree. Uh, if it's our native borers. And we do have a few native borers, but again, none of our native borers make that D-shaped exit hole that you see with emerald ash borer. Let's take a look at where emerald ash borer is in the state of Wisconsin, where 
where it started out as. In 2008, that was where we, uh, when we first found Emerald Ash Borer down in the Newburgh area. And I'm gonna kind of walk you through uh, where we found it. So down here in the Newburgh area, 2008, Here's 2009, and we did find a beetle in a trap in Green Bay. We did not find an infestation at that time, but we found a beetle in a trap. Here's 2010, 11, 12, and the end of 2013, so the end of this past year. Now when you look at this map, if you take all of these dots, these are known infestations of emerald ash borer. If you draw a 15 mile radius around each one of those infestations, all of the area within that 15 mile radius is an area where if people are going to be doing something about emerald ash borer, whether it's in their woods or whether it's their yard trees, they should be doing it at that point. If you're within 15 miles of a known emerald ash borer infestation, if you want to be doing something to protect your ash trees or to remove your ash trees or to do a harvest in your woodlot, you should be thinking about it by that point, by the time you're within 15 miles. So if you're going to consider insecticide treatments, which I'll talk about a little bit later, um, this is the point where you should be thinking about it, when you're within 15 miles or with, when you're within a quarantined county. And Door County is now quarantined because we have found our ash borer here. We have a forest management document. There are some copies back up on the table, and that talks about salvage or pre-salvage in your forested stands if you are within 15 miles of a known emerald ash borer infestation or if you're in a quarantined county for emerald ash borer. You should be thinking about what you want to do in your woodlot because it is expected that within, a 15, within 15 years, emerald ash borer will spread naturally five to 15 miles from a known infestation. And so it will move, and that's all by itself. That's without help from people. Um, so again, people tend to move it a lot faster than it moves on its own, but it'll certainly move on its own. So let's take a look at those same maps that I just showed you with a 15 mile radius drawn around them. So these are the areas of the state where people should be doing some kind of management if they're going to do management. And no management is actually required if you have, um, if you have emerald ash borer on your property. Um, so, but let's take a look at these spots. So this was 2008. Again, the first spot that we found it in was Newburgh. And you'll see that down in this southeastern corner, we've got a little blip here. This is from the infestations down in Chicago. So this is 2009, when we found it in that trap in Green Bay. 2010, 11, 12, and by 2012, 10% of Wisconsin's land area is within 15 miles of an emerald ash borer infestation. So this was just four years after finding it for the first time. This was the end of 2013, and we'd found it up here in, in, uh, in in the northwest up here. So this was the end of 2013, and here is the quarantine map for the end of 2013 down in the lower right-hand corner. All of the counties shown in red were quarantined by the end of, uh, end of 2013. So if we look at this for what it currently is, the colors are a little faded, I apologize for that. But here's, here's the current map. So we're looking up here at Door County, and you can see that now Door County is shaded in. In the lower right-hand side, where we've got the, the uh, county quarantine map, Door County is now a red county. The 15-mile radius around the two infestations in Door County, because we have one in Gibraltar Township near Fish Creek, and we have one here in Sturgeon Bay. So if you draw a 15-mile radius around each of those infestations, much of the county is now within 15 miles of a known emerald ash borer infestation. And the, the infestations that we have noted have not been delimited. Um, the Department of Agriculture, Trade, and Consumer Protection no longer does delimiting surveys um, to, to determine exactly where emerald ash borer is. So we've done some, some real preliminary surveys to determine how big the emerald ash borer um, sites are that we found, but they're very, very preliminary. So it could be much larger than what we're aware of, or it could be just exactly the size that we've seen. This is the area where we have 
where we have seen emerald ash borer. Uh, the, uh, the area up here in Gibraltar Township is a, a larger area. It's a wooded area. Um, there's a lot of declining ash trees in a, in a slightly larger area. And the site down here in near Sturgeon Bay, this is a big dot. I, may, I put it on the map so you could see it as a big dot. It's not quite that large in reality, um, or I, I guess it could be. We haven't had a chance to look to see if it's that large in reality. Um, but uh, that's the location of the two infestations here in Door County. And the pink shaded area is the, all of the area within 15 miles of those infestations. So again, if you're within 15 miles, or quite frankly, if you're in a quarantined county, if you're gonna be doing something about emerald ash borer, or doing something to protect your trees, doing something to manage your trees, you should definitely be thinking about what it is you want to do now. And we'll talk about those as soon as I show you some dramatic impact photos. So let's look at a couple of um, pictures that show just how bad emerald ash borer can be. So emerald ash borer kills ash trees. It kills all true ash trees, which are fraxinous species. Mountain ash is not a true ash species, so mountain ash is not at risk. Kills all ash species. So this is a street in Toledo. Um, on the left-hand side is before, and on the right-hand side is after. You can see there is one tree that is not an ash tree on the street, back here. All the rest are dead from emerald ash borer. And these are big trees. So emerald ash borer doesn't really care the size of the tree or the health of the tree. It can attack and eventually kill those trees. Emerald ash borer will attack and kill anything that's larger than one inch. So even young trees, once they get to be one inch in size, can be attacked and killed by emerald ash borer. Here's another urban shot. This is the same street. This blue house is this blue house. So before and after, another street of, of ash trees. And a lot of communities planted a lot of ash uh, in the 70s after Dutch elm disease went through and took out a lot of the elms. So in some communities, there's up to, say, 40% ash. Uh, in some communities that, that are street trees. Uh, so how many of you have more than three ash on your property, and like, a, like a yard? Okay, it's good to know. Okay, here's what, here's what emerald ash borer is gonna look like in um, a forested setting. So this is down by Newburgh. This is in Wisconsin. There we go. Okay, this Y in the river this fork in the river is gonna show up in the next picture. So this is in 2009. This was one year after we identified emerald ash borer in this, in this area of Newburgh. And emerald ash borer had already been in the Newburgh area for at least five years by the time we were able to find it. Because it takes some time for emerald ash borer to enter an area, for the population to build up enough to kill a tree for, to make us notice. So when a tree declines and dies, usually some, someone notices. And then we go in and take a look and realize, oh, it's emerald ash borer. Okay, so this is 2009. This fork in the river will show up. This is 2013. Here's that fork in the river. All of the skeletons that you see standing here are all ash trees, all dead ash. So this is four years later. Emerald ash borer had been present in this site for at least nine years by this point. So it's really ramped up and has started killing trees. Here's another example. This is also down in the Newburgh area. This is a forest that is primarily ash. Uh, this was 2012, so we'd known about emerald ash borer for quite a while. There's a lot of this stand that was already dead in 2012. But if you remember back to 2012, a lot of the state had a pretty major drought during 2012. And emerald ash borer populations had really ramped up in Newburgh by 2012, because it had been there. Um, for a number of years by then. So this is the stand one year later. There were still ash trees alive in, here's 2012 again. So there's still some green out here and apparently there was still some live ash trees because here's 2013. Emerald ash borer is really, really effective at killing ash trees. So what are your options? If, if you want to do something about emerald ash borer or, or if you don't, what are your options? Eradication used to be an option. When we first found emerald ash borer in the United States, there was this big kick to try and eradicate it. We thought we could get rid of it. We didn't realize how far it had already spread by the time we identified it. 
So eradication used to be an option. We don't do eradication anymore. We just simply don't. We know that we are not going to be able to stop it. We're not going to be able to control it that way. And that's basically a waste of money at this point. So we don't do eradication anymore. You do have the option of doing nothing, and your ash trees will die. And that's OK. If that's OK with you, that's OK. You, you have that option to do nothing. Or you can do something. And if you want to do something, what do you do? And when do you do it? Well, I always, I always start with the, uh, the question of when do you do it, because that's kind of a critical one, especially for you folks, where we've now found it already in Sturgeon Bay and up near Fish Creek. So with, this is a graphic created from some stands of trees, of ash trees in Michigan. And on the bottom here, um, let me get my, there we go. On the bottom here is years from the time the emerald ash borer is identified in a stand. And this on the left hand side is percent mortality of ash. So emerald ash borer is identified here and you know maybe a couple of trees died and so someone looked more closely and they said oh yeah there's something going on. So, so by year about four you've got maybe eight percent mortality in that stand. So there's a few trees that have died um, and, and people are starting to notice, and, but it's, you know, it's nothing major. By year five, here, we're up to almost 20%, and year six, we're at almost 30% mortality of the ash trees in that stand. Two years later, by year eight, we're up here at almost 100%. And the reason we get that big jump in just two years is because emerald ash borer, when it's first introduced into a stand, the population is low, and it takes a while to build up. But eventually, as that population builds, and each female insect is laying between you know, 40 and 100 eggs, all of a sudden, you get a huge population spike at some point. And usually, that's between six and eight years. And then you get a lot of tree mortality. So it jumps from 30% to about 100% in just a couple of years. And a lot of times, when people first hear about emerald ash borer, like right now, you're all worried about it, you're coming to meetings, you're, you're looking up information on the internet, you're, you're doing something, you know, you're, you're thinking about it, you're thinking about what you want to do with your property, and then nothing really happens for a while. Trees, whoops, trees don't die right away. It maybe takes a few more years to start seeing some significant mortality in, in your forested stand, and you think, well, DNR didn't know what they were talking about. Man, you know, they thought this was going to be bad. This isn't so bad. And then you get out here to years six, seven, and eight, and you jump up here to this almost 100% mortality. And I don't want this to take you guys unaware because this happens every time. Here's another example out of Michigan, another stand. Emerald ash borer was introduced, identified here when a tree or two died and someone actually took notice. After another few years, a few more trees died. So we're sitting here at 30% in 2004. Two years later, we jumped up to 80% mortality in just that two years. But it takes some time to get there. So I don't want people to, to forget that the trees are going to die unless, unless you treat them with, a, with an insecticide. So let's talk about some of the management options. We'll talk about some of the preventing accidental introductions and slowing buildup options, like quarantines, the NR40 invasive species rule, and preemptive removals and pre-salvage. We'll talk about some insecticide treatment options. We'll talk about forest management and silviculture. And then we'll talk about natural and biological controls. And then we'll open it up to questions. So let's talk about quarantines and the NR40 invasive species rule first. The quarantines are a state level quarantine that are put in place at the county level. So the entire county of Door County is quarantined for emerald ash borer. And what is affected by that quarantine is all ash products with bark, all hardwood firewood, not just ash firewood, and those materials and nursery stock, any, any ash product that has bark on it. Um, those materials cannot move from a red county, a quarantined county, into a white county without a compliance agreement or certification. And Tim or Brooke can give lots more information about compliance agreements um, or certification. 
and we can cover that if we need to, or you can, you can ask them a question directly if, if necessary. Uh, but there are options to move some products out if they are treated properly, um, and if you have a compliance agreement or certification. So the quarantine is at a county level. It should not move out of Door County. The NR40 invasive species rule is something that the DNR administers, and it's a within county um, quarantine, so to speak. And it talks about following reasonable precautions to minimize the movement of emerald ash borer within the, within the county level quarantine. Because there probably are areas in this county that don't have emerald ash borer. There may very well be more areas that do have it that we have not found yet. We've only found those two areas so far. But there's probably areas in the county that don't have emerald ash borer. And we don't want folks moving stuff, moving infested firewood from, say, the northern part um, down to the southern edge of the county, which you could legally do because it's within the county quarantine. Um, so the NR40 invasive species rule tries to help minimize that long distance movement within the county. So an example is to keep ash firewood within 25 miles of where the tree was felled or within the quarantine, season the wood for two years near where the tree was cut. So trying to keep things local, not move it around and spread it around. Now, you guys have probably heard, perhaps, about all of the proposed changes to the NR40 invasive species rule uh, that are coming up, that are, that are proposed for uh, the next round of NR40. And with emerald ash borer, the proposal is to change it from prohibited, which is currently listed as, to a restricted species. And I, I heard in papers a lot that we were downlisting it, which I suppose being pro going from prohibited to restricted is a bit of a downlisting. But all that really means is that we're not going to make you control it if you have it on your property. Because if it's a prohibited species and you have it on your property, NR40 says you must do something about it. We recognize that the emerald ash borer is going to come whether you do anything about it or not, and, and oftentimes it's through no fault of your own. And so if we change that to a restricted classification on emerald ash borer, you can have emerald ash borer on your property, and you don't have to do something about the trees or the emerald ash borer on your property. It's still it's still impacted by the NR40 invasive species rule. You're still not supposed to move it. You're still not supposed to transport it. You're still not supposed to sell it. I haven't found anyone wanting to sell emerald ash borer yet, but, um, but that is one of the proposals, is to downlist it from prohibited to restricted, but it will still be in NR40, and it will still be impacted by NR40. Let's talk about preemptive removals and pre-salvage harvests. What does that mean? Preemptive removals or pre-salvage harvests means you're removing those trees before you know they're infested. So in areas that we don't know we have emerald ash borer yet, if you're gonna go in and do some ash tree removal, that is a preemptive removal or a pre-salvage harvest. Preemptive, re preemptive removals occur usually in municipalities or your yard. Uh, pre-salvage harvests would be something done in a forested setting. In many cases, um, municipalities will do preemptive removals of ash that are not infested and just simply remove ash that have any defect or they'll remove a small ash that maybe was planted just before we knew emerald ash borer was on its way because removing a small ash will have less visual impact if they remove a small ash and plant another small tree back in its place. Um, or if they get homeowner requests of, you know, this, this ash looks bad in my yard, or it's leaning, or, um, you know, it's a, they, they think it's a hazard. Uh, if they get homeowner requests, they may remove the ash trees for that. Or they may do orderly removal throughout the city, even though they know that they don't have emerald ash borer yet. So these are some examples of preemptive removal. What this does is it spreads out the cost of all those tree removals for the cities or the townships or whoever's having to do that tree removal, it spreads out the cost over a number of years. Because tree removal and then planting back into those sites is really pricey um, for a lot of municipalities. So preemptive removals is something that, that some uh, municipalities have, have done. 
Insecticide treatments. There's a couple of options for insecticide treatments, and municipalities have perhaps a few more options than property owners do, um, only because municipalities can work with some of the um, some of the tree care companies and get uh, perhaps some of the different products or or work in in large numbers of trees and get perhaps a little different a little better rate. Uh, but if you work with a tree care company you'll get access to all of the different chemicals that are available for treating emerald ash borer. And there are quite a few chemicals out there now for treating emerald ash borer. Some of them you can do yourself. Many of them you will need a tree care company, a certified arborist that can do tree injections um, to be able to, to treat those. There is a document out there called Insecticide Options for Protecting Ash Trees for Emerald Ash Borer. Uh, the, this is available online. Additionally, you guys probably picked up at the, at the front a uh, UW Extension document uh, about some of the insecticide options. So there are a variety of insecticide options. The insecticides do work. Your tree has to be healthy enough to take up those insecticides. So if your tree has a lot of decline in it, for whatever reason, maybe two years ago you put in a sprinkler system and lopped off half the roots and the tree declined and, and half the crown died that tree's not quite as healthy as maybe it could be. And it may not be able to take up the chemical and to be able to protect itself. But if you have a healthy tree that can take up that chemical, the chemicals do protect from emerald ash borer. They will protect your tree. The key is though, you're gonna have to treat the tree for as long as you wanna keep the tree alive. Some of the chemicals need to be reapplied every single year. Some of the chemicals, which can be uh, injected by tree care companies, by certified arborists, some of those can be applied every other year or in some cases every three years. The costs for some of those are higher, but they're spread out over more years. So you have to weigh the, the benefits of, of that when you're uh, deciding which chemical you want to utilize. Now, one thing to think about, and when you guys go home and look at the trees in your yard or, or wherever the trees are that you're thinking maybe you want to save, it can get expensive to treat those trees every year or every other year or every three years. So you'll want to decide which trees mean the most to you, which ash trees, and again, you only need to treat ash, which ash trees mean the most to you that you want to sink some money into for protection. And again, if you're within 15 miles of a known emerald ash borer infestation, you should be thinking about uh, what you're going to do with your trees. If you're within the, the city limits of Sturgeon Bay, where we know we have emerald ash borer right here, um, you should be thinking about treating this year or next year um, if you're going to if you're going to save a tree. So, when you go home, at least look your trees over and decide which ones you might want to protect. And again, you don't have to protect any of them; they can all die. Uh, that's perfectly fine. Um, there's there's absolutely nothing that's required. But if you have a valuable tree that you want to protect, you might consider that. Forest management and silviculture. For those of you that have forested property, um, there are some options, salvage or pre-salvage, or doing forest management to promote other species, because we are going to lose the ash. Emerald ash borer is going to kill all the ash. And I often get the question of, well, won't emerald ash borer just sweep through an area and then when it moves on, whatever ash is left can grow? Emerald ash borer is here to stay. And it will be here to stay as long as there is an ash tree alive. And so for decades, emerald ash borer will be present. Because there are, if you walk into any forested setting, there are a lot of ash in the understory that are growing up. Eventually, they will all get large enough that they can be attacked by emerald ash borer. Additionally, there will always be someone somewhere that sells their home that doesn't tell the next homeowner, I've been treating this ash tree for the last 10 years. The new homeowner is not going to treat that ash tree, and emerald ash borer is going to come in and attack it. So emerald ash borer is kind of here to stay. It is going to wipe out the ash. There is a little bit of work in Michigan looking at resistance in ash. The resistance in ash is a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction of the population of ash. And they actually have not identified a true resistance. They don't know if these trees are really resistant. So we don't even know if there's going to be any ash that can survive this. Maybe, um, but, but we don't know for sure. So if you have forested land, you can let emerald ash borer run through it and kill off the ash and just see what comes back. 
that's an option. Or if you want to do some kind of management, you can go in and harvest the ash to promote other species in the stand. Some species need certain management techniques and, and other species uh, need different management techniques to get that regeneration to come up underneath. So some of them like larger openings, some of them like smaller openings. Um, so you can work with the, the foresters, and that was Bill Ruff and Chris Polzak, and I think they're both in the back. Um, you know, work with them to ask uh, some of your questions. Many times, the prescription for a property is going to be very specific to that property because they'll take into account your management goals as well as all the specifics of the property and come up with a management plan to perhaps promote some of the other species that you've already got on your property or give you some ideas for what could be planted in the place of the ash when you lose the ash. The document, uh, Emerald Ash Borer Forest Management, again, I think there's still a few copies available on the back table if you don't have that. It's also available online. It does talk about um, the quarantines. It does talk about a lot of different situations like do you have a lot of ash? Do you have a very little ash? You know, zero to 20% of your stand is ash or is more than 40% of your stand ash? You know, how much, how much ash is in your stand? Because the amount of ash that you have will really dictate what kind of management you want to do in there or what kind of manage management you might need to do in there. So work with the DNR foresters. They're more than happy to, uh, to answer your questions related to managing your stand with, uh, around emerald ash borer. I usually get the question, what do we do with the infested wood? Is it safe to burn? Is it safe to utilize? Um, does it have to be destroyed? It does not have to be destroyed. The logs, if you're doing a forest management practice, the logs can be debarked and utilized just like any other log. Emerald ash borer lives just under the bark. They do not bore through the tree. So that wood is still able to be utilized. If the trees are allowed to die, ash trees can become quite brittle. So your options may be limited if those ash trees are standing dead. But if you go in and harvest, uh, harvest ash, the logs are certainly utilizable. Uh, emerald ash borer does not bore through the wood. And then firewood can be burned safely. Uh, if you have ash on your property that you want to split for firewood and burn in your fireplace, that's perfectly, perfectly acceptable. Even if it's infested firewood that you've gotten off your property and you're going to burn in your fireplace, you're just going to burn up the bugs when you throw them in the wood stove. That's perfectly OK. <laughs> All right, let, let me talk about natural and biological controls real quick. Biological control agents are other living things that kill emerald ash borer. So other insects, other diseases, other viruses, those sorts of things. Uh, biological control agents usually control about 10% of an emerald ash borer population. They will not wipe out emerald ash borer. We do, um, we do have releases of some biocontrol agents that we've been doing. They're tiny, tiny parasitic wasps. And they are in the wasp family, but they are not capable of stinging. And in many cases, they're about the size of a sesame seed. They're very, very tiny. There is an application process that the DNR submits to, and uh, the, the US Department of Agriculture grows these insects that have gone through rigorous testing to make sure that they are going to be specific to emerald ash borer so that they're not going to be attacking any of our, our other insects out there. One of the key things, though, you have to have an active emerald ash borer population in order for us to introduce any of these biological control agents because these little biological control agents are so specific to emerald ash borer that if you don't have emerald ash borer, they can't survive. So you have to have emerald ash borer, uh, emerald ash borer already, and then we can come up with a good solution for where would be the best spot to release some of these if, uh, if someone is interested or if a community is interested. We are a little uncertain how they're going to have survived this past winter. Uh, we've got a couple of, of researchers doing some collections to see how they survived. Um, that's a bit of an unknown. But here's a couple of the little guys that we're introducing. The one on the left, the, the finger, the one on the finger, that's Tetrasticus. And they are, they, they are capable of flight, um, but they will lay an egg on an emerald ash borer larvae. The little wasp egg hatches, bores into the larvae, eats the larvae from the inside out. It's really pretty cool. 
Um, the one on the right is, is sitting next to this white thing is an emerald ash borer egg. That's about a eh, millimeter or two millimeters in size. So this little guy is a you know, sesame seed size at best. And this little guy is laying an egg on the emerald ash borer egg and the, the little egg will hatch and bore into the emerald ash borer egg and eat the egg from the inside out. It's not half as cool because the egg's not quite alive yet. But, um, and then there's one other species, uh, this little guy is called Oobius. There's one other species, Spathius agrylae, which is not doing well in our northern climates. So we actually, the, the US Department of Agriculture did find um, another species of Spathius that has gone through all the testing now and should be able to be released in the northern areas. Um, so perhaps this year or the following year we'll be able to do some releases of that. We are working on some releases for, for this current year. Uh, so we're going to continue these. But again, we don't know how they survived this past winter. We're hoping they did well. We do have some native insects that are utilizing emerald ash borer. Uh, so on the, on the left-hand side, we have uh, larval parasitoids. So these guys lay their eggs on emerald ash borer larvae. And on the right-hand side, we have egg parasitoids. And these are native, uh, native insects, with the possible exception of this, ulo <coughs> this Ulophidae here, this Pediobius. Um, we don't know if that one's native or it, it, it's here. So, uh, But even with all of these guys working on emerald ash borer populations, this will not eliminate emerald ash borer. It'll knock it back, it'll help, but it's not gonna eliminate emerald ash borer. Emerald ash borer is here to stay. With that, any questions? Yes. I have a neighbor who has about 13 ash trees, eight to 10 inch stock, 40, 50 feet high. Um, he has not done any trimming at all, and there's a lot of dead limbs and so on. Whereas I've got about uh, I don't know, 16, 17 them in my yard, and I have trimmed them up to about 50 feet, and hence have a smaller canopy to attack. Now, as I understand that you said that it kills the tree from the top down, uh, does that give me any kind of advantage uh, in terms of uh, Staying it off in terms of treatment uh, with insecticide, and that's my first question. Okay. My second question is my neighbor's an absentee neighbor, should I get on him about uh, <laughs> cleaning up his ash tree? Okay, so the question is um, Is an ash tree that has a lot of canopy, a lot of crown, more branches, some dead material, is that going to be more likely to be attacked by emerald ash borer? Um, than a tree with less crown that you've been pruning over the years. No. Um, the, the emerald ash borer is simply attracted to ash. If it's alive, that's all it needs. And the, the attractiveness is simply the smell of ash. So it's not the, it's not the size of the tree other than it has to, be, has to be bigger than one inch in size, in diameter. Um, so it's not the size of the tree, it's not the species, because it'll attack green, white, or black, and all of the cultivars. Um, so if you've got a, an ash in your yard that's a special cultivar, um, it's a cultivar of something. It's a cultivar of green ash, it's a cultivar of white ash, whatever the case may be. It, and it could be our native species. Um, but emerald ash borer is simply attracted to ash. So the, the dead branches and, the, and pruning up so that there's less of a crown isn't really going to impact whether they're attracted more to your trees or his trees. Uh, it just makes your trees look better, look nicer now. And then the other question was, should you, should you get on him about you know, cleaning up some of that dead wood? It's probably not going to make a difference for emerald ash borer. Um, the, only, the only thing that it could be helpful on is if he wants to decide which of those trees he's going to protect, if he's going to protect any of them, then you know some deadwood pruning or some kind of pruning to make them more, more healthy could be valuable on the ones he's going to protect. So, good question. Yes? You talked about the brittle standing wood. Um, let's say that you have a, a tree that still has 10 to 20 percent leaves on the canopy uh, on the crown worm. Mm -hmm. um, that's still uh, marketable wood, if you, if you harvest that tree, it hasn't, hasn't totally died? 
Bill or Chris, maybe you could answer this question better than me. The question is, if the tree is declining significantly, it's got maybe 10 or 20 percent crown left. When with emerald ash borer, the entire tree will decline, the entire crown will decline at once. It will not die branch by branch usually. It will decline as an entire tree. So there will be little tufts of leaves up there. So let's say there's 20 percent, maybe 10 percent of the crown left. The tree is still alive. Any thoughts? Is it just as alive as a tree with a full crown? I would think from a marketability standpoint, as far as if you want to saw it into lumber or something along that line, it would still be just fine. It still has some life issue. I'd add to that, if it's <coughs> animal ash for the, the cause, it may be some other cause and you have internal bores into the wood that's not even related to animal ash for it. Sometimes you don't know that until you run it through a saw or you mark it. There's some metal bore or pencil size hole right through the log that are not related to the metal ash. Thank you. Good point. And, and let me just reiterate in case folks didn't hear. Um, Chris said that as long as the tree is still alive, um, it's, it's still marketable. And then Bill pointed out that we do have some native borers in ash. And some of them will bore deeper into the wood. For instance, our red-headed ash borer, which is a longhorn beetle, will bore deeper into the wood. And then that does cause some structural, uh, some structural issues, and it, it creates larger holes in the wood. So yeah, good points. Over here, yeah. Linda, I want to thank you for your monthly electronic newsletter mm -hmm. uh, on all the forest issues. It's very informative. Um, and I'm wondering if you could elucidate a little bit more of the methods that are being used to treat trees. Are we talking about? boom truck and spraying herbicide all over uh -huh. the neighborhood? Are we talking about injections into the ground or granules that get taken up or injections into the tree? Or what are the, the methods that they're utilizing to save or keep trees healthy? Excellent question. Um, so what are, the, what are the methods of applying the chemicals that can treat the trees? Probably some of you remember when Dutch elm disease was going through and they used those giant misters to just fog entire trees. That's not what we're talking about with emerald ash borer. With emerald ash borer, we are talking about um, professional arborists that can inject chemicals directly into the base of the tree, and they do it in a special way to minimize the damage to the tree, but maximize the uptake of those chemicals to protect the tree. So there are direct tree injections. There are also soil injections with a special thing that looks like a giant hypodermic needle that they do soil injections. Um, there are also what are called root drenches, which is a little bit more common for homeowner products. And that is, um, you mix it up in a bucket, swirl it up, and then you pour it around the very base of the tree. The tree takes up that chemical and then moves it throughout the remainder of the tree, protecting the rest of the tree. So those are the main ways of protecting a tree. Uh, for against emerald ash borer. There are some products that can be sprayed on the bark that can soak into the bark. Uh, those also have to be applied by a certified arborist. Uh, but, uh, but for homeowners, the root drench can be workable. In this particular area of the state, with your thin topsoils and your fractured bedrock, you might run into some issues with those root drenches. So direct injections to the trees might work better for the trees. The chemicals that you mix up in a root drench and pour around the base of the tree have to stay there long enough that the tree can take up the chemical, which may not be very long, but if it runs right down a crack in the bedrock, well, that doesn't do you much good, doesn't do the tree much good. Um, so depending on your situation, uh, an injection with the chemicals by a certified arborist may be the better bet in some, of, in some locations up here. Yeah. Can, can an individual landowner get, first are the chemicals restricted that a landowner can't use them? And then if so, can an individual landowner get certified so they can just do this themselves? So first, mm -hmm. can I go out and buy it or is it restricted? Okay. Is it a recommendation or a restriction? So the question is on the chemicals. Are these restricted use chemicals? Um, or why can't the average homeowner, landowner, just go buy some of these? Some of them, you can just go to Walmart and buy, or Stein's, or Lowe's, or Home Depot, or whatever, carry, whatever place up here carries your chemicals, and, and purchase some of the options to mix up in a bucket and pour on the base of the tree. There are certainly homeowner options. Usually that's an imidacloprid product, and, and those can be used by anyone that can go in and buy pesticides. Um, some of the other 
pesticides that are recommended for use need to be applied by a certified arborist because of the system that is used. You need to drill into the tree. You need to have a special setup to inject this chemical into the tree. And if you were to get, if you were to get your pesticide certification and purchase the system to be able to inject the trees, you would be able to do that yourself. Um, but it's, it's time consuming to get the certification and learn how to do the process. Um, and the equipment can be quite pricey. Um, so in many cases, it's, it's more a, a skill level that's the bigger issue. You don't want to do more damage to your tree than emerald ash borer is doing, which I realize they're going to kill it. But you, you'd hate to you know, try and do this injection and realize that you just killed your tree and, and wasted your money. So that's part of the bigger issue, is, is the, the treatment methods do require some special, uh, special equipment. The large plantations that we put in 20 years ago, uh, are, is it better to be proactive and start ripping that stuff out and replacing it with something, maybe an old or something we still get from one of the state nurseries? And then in terms of timber harvest, basically the price of ash is depressed to the point where saw log is not worth a lot at this point, so you're pretty much limited to firewood, um, what you're going to cut. We don't have sawmills in this county. We can't go out to another county out of the zone with the, with the bark on. So our options are fairly limited there for harvest. So the question is, what do we do about plantations? Right. Should you be proactive? And what do you do about right? What do you do about bigger forested settings? And that was that was a multi-part question actually. So so let me let me address one. Or do you want to address the compliance agreements and moving? Hey, you want to step up here? So the quarantine is in place to limit the movement of ash and ash products. Um, mills and trucking companies can't get compliance agreements uh, through the Department of Ag Trade and Consumer Protection to move that wood during the off season when the beetle is under, presumably under the bark and not active. So if you had uh, a timber sale with a high volume of ash logs, and you wanted to sell it to a non-quarantine area, uh, you could do that as long as that mill were certified by us to be a receiving mill, and the trucker that were hauling it there is certified to haul it during that uh, off-season off time period. And then we would work with that receiving mill to make sure that they're processing that work in a timely manner, um, destroying the bark, bark fragments, chipping it up, making it so that the beetle can't survive um, in that non-quarantine county. If we were in, say, a find, EAB and Kiwani and counties farther south, Manitowoc, um, then you would be able to move ash products within that uh, quarantined area. Okay, Bill or Chris, you want to come down here and <clears throat> answer the uh, forest management part of it? Thank you. I think from a forest management standpoint, you talk about a plantation in particular. Um, something that's 20 years old that has a, a high percentage of ash in it. Um, if, it's, if it's predominantly ash and you wanted to start over, I mean, there are options available, you know, and, and you're more than welcome to sit down with, with Bill or I and we could talk about what options are available as far as starting over if it is something that is that heavy to ash. Um, if it was a smaller percentage of ash in a, in a plantation such as that, Depending on what percentage of, of that planting was ash, you may be just fine if you lose the ash in it anyways and allow the remaining species to, to occupy that site. So it, it's, it's very, you know, I, I wrote a lot of planting plans over the years. Bill's wrote a lot of planting plans over the years. And the, the percentage of ash that we prescribe in those plans really, really varies. So it, it's important to look at it as a site specific and basically walk through your plantation and talk about what options would be available because it's going to be very specific to each individual site. Um, Chris, would you stand in front of the other mic, please, while yep. you're talking safety? And again, you don't have to do anything if, if you don't want to, but understand that they will be dead. So. Mm -hmm. 
One other comment I'll make related to forest management. For those of you that maybe don't have larger acreages, um, in some cases, you know, you may be able to work with these guys to discuss maybe a, a group of neighbors that have smaller acreages if you want to do something in that situation as well. Because I know in some cases you've got four acres or, or maybe three acres of forested land. Um, you're still going to have ash dying in those, in those areas. Um, it just may be something that uh, uh, a logging company may not be interested in a three acre piece. Um, so you could work with these guys to, to discuss some options for that as well. So, yeah. Linda, you talked about that it may be too expensive to save all of your ash. How much are we talking with these, these treatments cost? I mean, we're talking 100 bucks a year a tree. Are we talking 500 bucks a year a tree? Sure. So the question is, how much is treatment for an ash tree going to cost? Um, depends on your product. So if you're looking at purchasing the product that a homeowner can buy at wherever you're going to buy your, your chemicals, um, that is going to run you, oh, for an average 8-inch tree, it's probably going to run you 60 or 70 bucks a year. Because um, you're going to need to measure this, the diameter of the tree, or maybe it's the circumference, I don't remember the label right off. And then you'll need to buy the appropriate amount of chemical to put on that size of a tree. So the bigger the tree, the more bottles of chemical you'll have to purchase and put on that tree. If you're going to go with a certified arborist, a tree injection, those are usually a certain dollar value per inch diameter of the tree. Um, in some of the, some of the chemicals, like the ones that only need to be applied every other or every three years, um, the, the prices of course go up. And, and I guess I don't know exactly what those prices would be, but it could be, Tracy, do you know anything right off? Yeah? I, I could give you an example. Sure. My, my brother lives in Dane County. He just had two trees down there, about 10 year old ash. And he paid $160 for two trees, and that's on a two year schedule. Okay, so those were 10 year old ash yeah. and $160 so on a. They're about 10, 10 inch count. Okay, on a two year schedule. Okay. Forty-year-old ash trees and about two hundred dollars a tree. A little more, and there's that every two years. Every two years. Okay, so there's a there's a range of prices, um, and uh, and a range of products as well. So you need to decide what's going to fit into your budget. And again, you know this this price difference. That's where deciding which trees are most important to you will come into play because it is going to be a cost. Yes. Could you tell us something about the chemicals that are used? The injection and the roof trench and uh, the uh, face of the tree. Tell you something about what the what the chemicals are. Since it is Door County and mm -hmm. those chemicals, I, I have some concerns about what's going to end up in my drinking water. Um, what's injected in the tree or injected in the roots? Particularly, what is injected in the roots or drenched in the roots? Mm -hmm. Where does how much does okay. it migrate and how long does it take for it to break down? Gotcha. Um, for some of that, I would have to look up the more specific information and I don't want to just guess. Is that in the literature that you have? I don't know if it's here that I have today. That would be more specific information. Um, but some of, the, some of the information about the chemicals that are available, um, the, the tree injection chemicals are going to be just located in the tree. They may also be, to a certain extent, in the leaves. So when the leaves fall, they will fall with the leaves, but they tend to break down pretty rapidly in the leaves, the chemicals do, um, is my understanding. If the tree's injected early in the year, mm -hmm. it will be still in the leaves in fall when the leaves drop? It, it's metabolized in the leaves. And so and when the leaves the fall. Leaves mm -hmm. Yep, because some of the products are good for two years or up to three years, so they do maintain themselves in the in the tree at an active uh, active state in the in the wood of the tree. Um, the imidacloprid, which is the root drench, um, is a, a product that can be uh, bound up by um, uh, organic material in the soil, which I realize is going to be an issue in these in some of the areas with real thin soils. So, but I could get more information, more specific information. Um, I, 
I don't want to just guess and some of that. It's one of them. The, the certified arborists can inject imidacloprid into a tree, but more commonly they will inject a couple of the other, or choose from a couple of other chemicals, right. dinotefuron. My own trees when I lived in Green Bay were treated by the city arborists mm -hmm. with Baypam and Benlate. Are either of those chemicals? No. Okay. No. Way in the back. Um, yeah, I wanted to try to touch back on the conversation earlier about exporting the wood out of the county. Mm -hmm. um, I'm with the Restore for Habitat, and we have been working with Dane County's Restore, the one in Madison and whatnot. They are partnered with Urban Woods, which is an outfit who processes all these ash trees, or actually any trees that come down, and they've been having great success with repurposing this wood by selling it for flooring, selling it to be made into furniture. Um, the Urban Wood Group is licensed to process the wood appropriately so that the bugs are taken care of the way it's kiln dried, it's a certain process. There is an, a Sawyer here in Algoma who's also certified to do that work. We are trying to bring those products in for the restore to sell because it's a recycled, repurposed material. But it's something also that's a very grassroots type movement and we need support to make those things happen. So in addressing the concerns and the cost, of dealing with acreages of ash and if we have these concerns and we are going to be facing this stuff, it's something I think we should consider and look into other resources to repurpose this way. Mm -hmm. I know of a number of the restore um, facilities in, in Michigan that have utilized a lot of emerald ash borer infested wood as well. So, yeah, great. Yeah. At, at what point does the tree become useless? I mean, when it's totally dead and there's not a leaf or anything on it. Um, is there anybody that wants it at that point? Are you talking for lumber purposes or for, any for anything? Chris? Firewood. Um, stand up, speak here. <laughs> yeah, I guess it depends, Chuck, on what the what use you're looking for it as. Um, firewood, it, it's good for quite some time yet. Um, it can be dead for a relatively short period of time, i.e. less than a year, and I've seen the Algoma Lumber Companies of the world, they, they'll still take that wood um, that's freshly dead, but if it's been standing dead for probably longer than a year, I would say it's r virtually useless from, from a, a saw log standpoint. Um, it's just a, a, a rough idea. I guess there's several of us here from the county that we realize that there's people that don't want us to cut a tree. And it, it gets pretty difficult when you think, when you look at those pictures that you're showing, where at five years, yeah, it may look pretty good, but by year seven, you're pretty much de depleting any green that the tree has. And for us to just, some people say, just let it stand. You know, well, I don't. Thank you care to look at a forest like that either. Yeah, and again, obviously I've been involved with a lot of the decisions and um, that's the decision you guys are, are gonna have to make and, and realize that even doing nothing is can be an appropriate decision. You know, the, the woodpeckers would, would thank you for leaving a certain percentage of those trees as well, um, but understand that there are options to do something. Um, up here, Where? yeah. We did talk about um, prices. Do we have any applicators even in northeastern Wisconsin that are up and running to do this? Is there anybody in Green Bay working yet, or because then we're, I mean, we're, we're, you know, as everyone knows, in the visitor, visitor bureau tells everybody we're a destination. <laughs> so for them to drive up here from where they're coming from to do this treatment, that's going to add a lot of expense to the at least initially. So I'm just curious, are there any? Mm -hmm. Do we know of any applicators that are actively doing this in our area? Do you want to come down and answer? We have two tree care companies here today. Okay. Um, and then there are a number of companies down in the Green Bay area, um, down in Allegheny County. Who's working? Who's in, who, who, what door county business is doing this? Dave Treesers. And? Dave Corn Tree. Excellent. Thank you. So, I'm sorry, Dave's Tree Service and Acorn? Acorn Tree. Okay. Excellent. 
Okay, and then yeah, the um, if you look in the if you look in the phone book under tree care, there may be companies out of the uh, the Green Bay area as well. But you could contact these guys as well. So, can you both do tree injections? Yes. Okay. Fabulous. Anything else on that, Tracy? Or, no. No. Just make sure they're insured. <laughs> <laughs> okay, make sure they're insured. Good information. Question up here. How effective are these treatments? I mean, nothing's 100% guaranteed, but have they shown that these treatments are effective, especially down the way? I mean, you don't want to make this financial mm -hmm. commitment for five years, you know, and then find out that you're still going to lose this tree. So the question is, how effective are the chemical treatments? The chemical treatments are very effective. Uh, the, even the ones for, for homeowners, the imidacloprid, which uh, that's probably the least effective of all the chemicals out there, even those have been shown to be 95 to 97% effective. And so if you've got that level of effectiveness in the tree and you're treating it each year, um, that's perfectly acceptable for the tree. It will continue to survive. And some of the products that the certified arborists can use are much more effective than that, nearly 100% effective. So yes, they are effective. They will keep the trees alive if they're applied properly. Yep. Uh, yes, is the DNR planning for the state of Wisconsin uh, on doing anything more than they already have to prevent additional introduction of the EAB into Dark County? The reason I ask is I drove up from Florida Last week, I stopped at the rest stop uh, in Denmark. It's the only rest stop on I-43 between Milwaukee <laughs> and uh, Door County. And uh, I looked to see if there were any uh, bulletins about the Emerald Ash Borer, and indeed there was. However, that bulletin was from 2006 and stated that the Emerald Ash Borer had not yet been found in Wisconsin. Uh, perhaps it's the people on the highway that get these that don't post them, or perhaps somebody's not watching, but this is the only opportunity, perhaps, that a family with a camper uh, mm -hmm. and firewood may have to say, oh, this is, maybe we shouldn't bring our firewood into our county. Mm -hmm. um, do you have a comment on that? I, uh, so, the so other the thing is about, and just as, a, as an anecdotal, when I was in college, I worked for uh, pickup labor for Mayflower. And you could always tell people who moved uh, that had their moving uh, paid for by the employer because those were the people who moved their firewood. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, when you said it was campers in Colorado, it made me think, is anybody talking to the moving companies and, and other people who may be bringing this into Door County uh, from, from other states, other areas of Wisconsin? So, so the question is about outreach and how we're, how we're handling outreach and awareness. Um, and emerald ash borer, because it basically hides under the bark and, um, and, and hitchhikes very easily, emerald ash borer has been a very, very difficult insect to get the word out about and to make people aware of and to have an impact. And there are so many avenues that it can move. I mean, you mentioned just a few of them. And it has been a struggle to reach all of those avenues in a timely manner. Uh, we, have been, we have been trying to get the word out. Um, we have been trying to reach as many new places as we can whenever we think of, oh gosh, this is a, this is a problem area, um, you know, or, or we realize that someone is moving ash and we didn't, didn't think about it before. Um, some of the moving companies, uh, we have done some outreach to them. Um, we have done outreach to firewood dealers. We have done outreach to mom and pop firewood dealers. Um, we've done outreach to the campers and the hunters and the um, companies that provide moving supplies. And, you know, there's, there's only so much outreach that we can do to them that they will pass to their customers, but we've been trying. And I, I know that, you know, the, the um, document that you saw that was from 2006, I would guess we've sent something more recent to them than that. I guess I can't guarantee, but um, my goodness. Um, so we have been doing a lot of outreach to a lot of different groups. Um, it's just that it's such a sneaky insect, and a lot of people just aren't aware of how easy it is to move emerald ash borer. Even when we tell them, sometimes it's, it just doesn't have the impact of, of seeing it um, move as easily. So. Yeah, up here. Uh, 
One more question on timber harvest. Okay. Bill and Chris. Mm -hmm. uh, in good timber practices, when we do a harvest, we leave a certain number of trees per acre to stand plus buffer zone. If we do any more cutting, is there going to be any dispensation to those rules? You know, assuming we replant with something else, um, it doesn't make, seem to make sense to let that timber stand if it's going to die. Having been to southern, northern Indiana and southern Michigan and seen sticks in the air with nothing on them, I prefer not to have my property. Yeah, when it comes to evaluating trees to cut or which trees to leave, we'd have a hierarchy system and it's based on a number of factors and one of them is what we consider high risk. And now that we do have uh, emerald ash borer in Dora County, um, in a quarantine county, all ash is considered high risk. So that's one of the rules that will enable us to drop below what would might be a standard uh, base level of density in a stand um, you can do that. It's allowable if you're removing high-risk trees. So ash would fall into that category. And what about buffer zones? And are we going to run a follow the Door County Planning Department with regard to buffer zones? I can get to it. Okay. <laughs> we, uh, we do have regulations in the county zoning ordinance for areas that are under county zoning. Um, depending on how large an area of trees you're talking about removing, or if you're along the shoreline, uh, we do have some restrictions, um, except that if you work with a forester and we know that you are removing emerald ash borer, I mean, if you're removing ash trees because of emerald ash borer, um, then you won't have to worry about our rules. But please, if you're going to be removing anything, and when I'm talking about on the shoreline, I'm talking about within like 35 feet of the ordinary high water mark. If you're removing anything in the shoreline, or if you're removing a large inland stand, please make sure you give us a call and we can work with Bill and Chris to figure out. So do we need an advance letter from the planning department if we wish to do that in advance of that so we don't want to follow through and get a nasty letter saying we violated your practices? You don't need a letter from us, we need a letter from the foresters. Okay. And if it's on the shore, we'd like to do a site visit with you so that we can talk about okay. shoreline vegetation. Thank you. So that was within 35 feet of the high water mark. Um, so contact you guys for more information on that and just make sure that you mention that it's ash that you're concerned about and that you're dealing with emerald ash borer. Okay, excellent. Question up here. Uh, yeah, I have a quick question. I have uh, pictures of some or some holes in my trees. Who would I show it to here to see if they can tell whether those are D-shaped or circles? <laughs> <laughs> Good question. Um, you can show it to me afterwards, or Tracy could take a look at it. Um, either either one of us. So sure. And that's a that's a good question because I, I mentioned that we have other native borers on ash, and our native borers make circular, perfectly circular, round exit holes or oval exit holes, and those oval exit holes can sometimes look D-shaped. They can they can be kind of sneaky that way. So. Um, so yeah, we can take a look at those though. Um, oh yes, I am finished with my slides. We could have a couple more lights if we want um, and open the shades if we need a little more light in here. Yep. All right, I was uh, down here. If you have a forest, do you need to report? Do you need to check? Do you need to know that they're out there? Do you need to tell somebody? And is there? Another part of the question would be, is there someone who, some place that you can get them removed without a cost to the homeowner? Okay, good question. Um, so, so the question is, um, is there someone that you need to report it to if you have emerald ash borer or think you have emerald ash borer? And then is there someone that can remove those trees at no cost or who would be doing that at potentially no cost? So the first part of the question, because Door County is now quarantined, we don't need to know every single location of Emerald Ash Borer. Um, ah, let there be light. Um, so it, it, it can be useful to know if it's, if it's in other areas, like we know it's in Gibraltar Township. So we probably don't need any more locations from Gibraltar Township. It's probably all over in Gibraltar Township. Um, we know it's in Sturgeon Bay in this area, so we probably don't need additional reports from this area. But, you know, if there's, if there's a, a township in the very southern end of the county that it's found in, 
it could be useful to know the first find down there so that we can let people know that it's down there. Um, but we don't need to know every infestation now because it's here and it's gonna spread and it's probably in more places than we realize. Um, the other question is, is anyone removing the trees for free? Um, there is no program to remove trees that are infested that I'm aware of. Um, you might find a, a neighbor that needs some firewood. Um, depends where that tree is. Now you have to be careful. You don't want to be cutting trees next to lines or dropping them on your house. Um, so in, in that case, you may need to contact a, an arborist to come in and, and remove those trees. Um, but there's, there's no programs that I'm aware of where they're just removing the trees. So, over here. Have, has there been, been any information regarding the treatments that are available as far as collateral damage to, say, the birds that might be, you know, mm -hmm. woodpeckers or something that might be eating ash borers before they succumb to the chemicals? Mm -hmm. Okay, so any quest, uh, the question is, uh, are there any studies about um, how the chemicals are impacting other things besides emerald ash borer? So when you inject these trees or you treat these trees and the trees take up the chemicals and they kill emerald ash borer, the woodpeckers, the, the emerald ash borer, when they are killed, they pretty, act, or pretty quickly become inactive and the woodpeckers don't hone in on them. So they're not eating the dying larvae. Um, additionally, they have found that the parasitic wasps, the little biological control guys, can figure out that that one's dying and they don't infest those. They can also figure out if another parasitic wasp has already parasitized that larvae. And they're like, well, pff, not gonna tread on their territory, so they'll go find another one. So, so it's, the impact is minimal for um, once, the, once the trees are treated and that chemical is inside the tree and killing the emerald ash borer, the impacts on other insects and, or other, uh, other critters is very minimal. If other insects feed on the tree, like there's um, ash plant bug, which causes defoliation, well, it'll take care of those too, which is a bonus. Um, there, aren't, there aren't a lot of good insects that feed on ash. Ash is not a highly desired tree um, by a lot of good insects. Um, we'll get forest tent caterpillar defoliating it. It's probably okay if we knock those out. Um, so. Uh, so the, the impacts on other species are pretty minimal, from what I understand. Related, yeah. you just mentioned some caterpillars. I raised caterpillars. Mm -hmm. In fact, my second four-horn sphinx moth caterpillar mm -hmm. came out just as I was leaving today. There would be other uh, ash, various ash would be opposed to other moth caterpillars, which aren't harmful at all. Mm -hmm. I'm guessing they might also be killed yes. if they eat the leaves that they treated ash. Right, so the question is, other insects that feed on treated ash, would they be killed? And the answer is yes. These are general insecticides that are ingest, in, injected into the trees. And so any insect feeding on the ash would be killed by that. Any, any insect feeding on the treated ash would be killed. And there, there is some concern that you know, there are some species of insects and some species of fungi that are ash specific. And if we lose ash, we will lose those species, whether they're being, whether the trees are being treated or not. Um, if we lose ash, we will lose those species. So, yes. In regards to <clears throat> leaving the ash trees stand dead mm -hmm. over a period of time, I guess when the DNR harvested the beech trees up in the Whitefish Dune State Park, I think it was my understanding that for a safety factor, the canopies start to fall before the trunk. Is that the same case scenario for an ash tree? Will, will the canopy limbs fall before the trunk actually falls over a period of years? It's a good question. I'm going to repeat it just for the camera. Um, so the question is, with the, the beach harvest at Whitefish Dune State Park, there was a, a hazard along the, the trails because the beach trees, as they are declining from beach bark disease, they tend to snap, the tops snap when there's still green foliage up there. So the question is, will ash do the same thing? No. Um, with beech bark disease, that's a combination of a tiny scale insect and a fungus, and that combination creates weakness in the stem. And, uh, and beech tends to be a little bit lighter wood, and um, fungi come in and infect that wood once beech bark disease comes in, allows that beech to snap off more easily. 
Ash doesn't operate the same way. And when emerald ash borer kills an ash tree, it starts infesting the top of the tree, slowly works its way downwards, but it tends to kill the tree slowly but surely, and then all of a sudden it's just, it's gone, it's done. So it's not, it, it's a little different than, than beech bark disease. Um, and the, the whole tree tends to die, it'll remain standing. You might get some limbs that break off just because the tree is dead and they're starting to become brittle, but it won't snap like beech trees will snap with those green leaves on. So, and, and we will be able to go, after we're done with the question and answer and after we've addressed everyone's questions, um, if you guys wanna see what the ash trees will start to look like as they start to decline, if you wanna see what the woodpecker damage looks like, we'll be able to walk just outside here and take a look so that you can see a little more, a little more closely if you want. Um, all right, another, yeah. What is the, the little trap that's over your head on the slide? This one, in the yeah. lower right? That purple trap, it's a, a big, this big, big purple traps. Um, they are emerald ash borer traps. We hang them in trees. Um, they have lures that we put in them that make them smell like ash trees. We have to hang them in ash trees. They don't work fabulously. They're not a wonderful trap. If you're gonna use it locally, you can use it however you would like. Um, the, if you, if you debark it, most of the time, you're gonna be destroying the vast majority of, of emerald ash borer that are just under the bark. Uh, they're kind of, the larvae are very soft, very easily damaged. Uh, but if you want to move it out of a quarantined area, you do need to grind the bark um, or the wood, whatever you're processing. Uh, and it needs to be down to a size two by two by three? Two inch by two inch by? Oh, one inch by one inch in two dimensions. In some cases, that means you have to grind it twice. Um, and then you need a, a certification. Yeah, you need to contact DATCAP for compliance. Yep, and so DATCAP can um, give you the information um, if, you're trying, if you need to take it out of a quarantined county. But if you're gonna use it locally, that would be fine. Other questions, yeah? Could you just go over, I think it might have been a little confusing for the people, mm -hmm. the difference between a certified arborist and a certified applicator, because I, I think a lot of people are gonna go and look for a certified arborist, and they're very difficult to find here in Door County, but we do have certified applicators, such as the two gentlemen here today, gotcha. that are certified applicators. That's that okay, so, yeah, the, that's a good point. There is a difference between a certified arborist and a certified applicator. The certified applicator is someone that has the licensing and has the knowledge to be able to apply the chemical product, and that's what you guys need. A certified arborist is going to have gone through some additional classes and certification and be able to do tons of different stuff with your trees, which probably the certified applicators can do as well, but the certified arborist is going to have um, the certification from ISA? National Society of National Society of Aboriculture. Um, so you guys need a certified applicator to be able to, you, you need to find a certified applicator to be able to apply chemicals to your trees. If you run into someone that says, oh, yeah, I can, I can apply something to your trees, don't worry about it. And if they charge you, the state of Wisconsin has kind of a, a, a rule, a law, that says you do have to be certified in order to apply chemicals um, if you're gonna be charging for that. So, um, and additionally, there are certain chemicals that you just have to be certified to be able to use those chemicals. So um, the, the people that you're looking for to be able to treat your trees need to be a certified applicator. So that's, that's a good distinction, thanks. Yeah. Are there specific categories that they have to be certified in, and some are applicable and some are not? Because you can be certified, mm -hmm. but, but maybe not in the point of Yes, there is. Yes? What, you, what category? You have to have turf and ornamental. Yeah. Are there any there, other there's categories? Different right, there's different categories of, of certification. So turf and ornamental is probably going to be the most common for someone treating for emerald ash borer. Yes. Okay. Is that what you have as well, turf and ornamental? Okay. All right. Any other questions? You guys have asked good questions. Let's go up and back. I have one. I'm not sure if you had yeah. or you guys know the answer, but just I'm kind of thinking of the gentleman who has like you know, 18 trees or whatever, mm -hmm. or the neighbor, and maybe you say, well, we're going to save these six, but let the other ones go. Do you initiate a treatment program on the ones you're going to save and just let the other ones go right next to them? 
or is it recommended that you would, I mean, is that, is that viable or do you mm -hmm. have to cut down and remove the trees right next to, you know what I mean? Yep. Good question. So if you have 18 trees and you've decided you're going to save three, do you start treating those three and remove the other 15? Or do you start treating those three and eh, let the other 15 just hang out there until emerald ash borer kills them? Depends on what you want to do with that space. If you want to remove some of those trees and get more trees growing in there right now, perfectly acceptable. If you want to let those trees die and then enjoy the woodpeckers that are going to come to those trees as emerald ash borer infests them, that's perfectly OK, too. You're treating those trees. And so even if the tree right next to them is pumping out thousands of emerald ash borer adults, the trees that you are treating will be protected. Good question. Yeah. Who's in charge or who's going to be doing the enforcing of the movement of wood products? Is that the forester or is that the Yeah, the Department of Ag Trade is in protection. So when we, when we receive reports about people moving wood outside the team, we follow up with investigation and potential enforcement but uh, we, we make that contact and try to do it some education and sign them up with a compliance agreement if need be. Yep. So, on the way in, I don't know if anybody else came on Highway 4257 North, but uh, I saw some I had installed with uh, large wood chips on them, I'm sure would not be one by one square. I'm just wondering now, how do I report this? Do I get the phone number? Sure. <laughs> so, so, so yeah, the question is who enforces it and DATCAP, uh, Department of Agriculture, Trade and Consumer Protection, they're the ones that have the enforcement power and they handle the, the quarantine enforcement. Um, and so if, if you do have something that you need to report, maybe someone's hauling firewood out um, and, uh, and you don't think that they're, that they're certified. Um, or you know you see a load of chips that you think can't possibly be certified, um, you can contact DATCAP and and they'll follow up with um, with enforcement or at least check into it and make sure that it is a certified um, certified product that's moving out. Yes. If you're a property owner, you have ash trees, you cut them down, mm -hmm. you leave them on your property mm -hmm. to use as firewood. Mm -hmm. Should the bark be taken off? So the question is, you have ash trees on your property, you cut them down, you make firewood, you keep the firewood right there on your property. Do you have to debark that firewood? No, because you're not moving that firewood. If those ash trees were infested, you cut them down, you make them into firewood, you stack the firewood, emerald ash borer that was in that infested wood could emerge from the firewood but it was going to emerge in the standing tree anyway, on your property. So it's okay. You don't have to do anything special to that firewood if you're keeping it right there on your property. Mm -hmm. I, I will say we're, we're pushing 235 right now. If anyone needs to leave, I will not be offended if you get up. Uh, that's okay. Um, and, and I, you know, thank you for coming. Um, I will stay. We'll keep asking, uh, keep answering questions. And then, like I said, we'll be able to walk out and see trees um, afterwards as well, just to show you guys what it looks like. So, but I just need, I wanted to let people leave if, if folks need to leave, because we're, we're pushing an hour and a half now. So, um, question here. Yeah. Now, you said something about um, a trailer full of bark and that going down the you can, you can move it within door company. Within now. door company, that's, that's like, I didn't say you took it out of door company. Oh, okay. Cell phone but you can't, yeah, you yeah. can move it within door company, am I correct? Correct. Correct. The quarantine says you cannot move uh, ash products or all hardwood firewood out of door county. That is the quarantine so line. So if I, mm -hmm. have, I, I, I have a huge force, but if, if one of my neighbors or somebody you know, within door county wants the trees, they can take the firewood still as long as they're in door county. Mm -hmm. We'd prefer it didn't move long distances in door county, but yes, it needs to stay if it stays in door county. Mm -hmm. That's fine. Other, yes. I know you've talked about this, and I apologize if you did, but sawed lumber can be removed from the quarantine area, correct? Can sawed when lumber be removed from the quarantine area if the bark is removed? The bark has to be removed. Yep. And you mentioned some type of certification. Mm -hmm. um, DATCAP can offer a, a certification to move those products out of the county. 
Um, but if the, if the lumber is debarked and a half inch of the wood is, is removed as well, then that removes all risk of emerald ash borer from that, uh, from that log in the wood, the, the wood is um, acceptable then. So, but you can contact ATCAP for all sorts of different certification options and, you know, just to make sure your bases are covered, you know, you can contact them and just say, hey, do I need, you know, do I need certification for this? This is what I've got. This is what I want to move and where I want to move it to. And they're great about um, being able to answer that pretty quickly and get you the certification. Yep. Is there any, any thought given to uh, state and county parks? Are you going to do your, any removal cuttings there? Do one of you guys, do you want to come down and, you can come down and stand here. <clears throat> Thanks, Linda. Uh -huh. Yeah, Eric Ilson, I'm the County Parks Director here. Um, yeah, we've been in discussions really last year or so on what to do with some of our larger parks that are more undeveloped, that have a lot of high percentage of ash trees, specifically Door Bluff County Park in the north part of the county. We've kind of looked into that uh, quite extensively. There was a management plan put together by uh, Chris and a uh, Bill in the last, um, I think 2007 it was first developed and at that point before Emerald Ash Borer was in Door County, they were recommending taking, um, if we'd consider a timber sale or timber harvest there, taking the percentage of ash tree in that park from 43% down to around 20%. So that's kind of what we were talking about this past winter and you may have seen some things in the paper or heard things uh, from a public meeting we had back in February or March this winter. Um, right now, no decision's been made yet, and of course now, recently, um, with Emerald Ash Borer Indoor County, we're kind of looking at what other options we do have if we move ahead with a decision like that or um, do something a little bit different. So it definitely will be on our agenda coming up in the next few months at the Parks and Airport Committee level, and um, I guess, as I mentioned, uh, Door Bluff is the, the main park we've been looking at, but certainly we're going to have to look into the future at the other park properties to see if there's any type of management we do there and kind of how we handle it from here in the future. So. Could I, yeah. could I ask you a follow-up question sure. on that? Yep. With the uh, harvest that had been done in the um, county parks already, and the gentleman's question over here about the depressed value of uh, ash on the stock, uh, are there any figures that I, I know you mentioned uh, from uh, Peslin's Park? Uh, there is some, I saw something today that uh, if uh, this was harvested, the money would go to the town of Liberty Grove. Uh, I don't know how that works for the county park. What kind of numbers are we looking at? Is there actually uh, any kind of reasonable profit to be made from? Timber out of these county parks with the depressed I might lean on the DNR foresters to help me out with that a bit. I know there's there'd certainly be some value as long as the wood's alive still. But I guess as far as a, a depressed price, I don't like to use the word depressed price. I mean, ash sells in this county and has sold as long as I've been here um, for and actually fared a good price. You know, a few years back, things were a little bit lower as the housing economy took a downturn. But as things are moving the other direction, um, ash stumpage prices are doing just fine in this county. Um, there is revenue that can be generated from ash on the stump. Um, if you have property that you'd like to harvest ash, it is very marketable. Um, it's not depressed. Um, it's not as high as sugar maple or red oak but it is it is still very marketable and still worth a significant amount of money if you if you do have ash on your property so do you, do you have any figures from the uh, county parks that have already been uh, harvested uh not on the county parks because we haven't harvested any in, in the county parks but dealing from private sales and state land sales that that we deal with not only in dora county but around the surrounding green bay area um I wouldn't have any figures for counties that are quarantined right now. But you were about to give a figure. Yeah, I, it's, we would base it on um, 
a unit of a thousand board feet. That's how it's it's sold, you know. And it, it can be um, 150 to 250 dollars per thousand board feet, which you know, if you have just a handful of, of larger trees, that's that's a thousand board feet. So you know, it could be as few as three or four trees would be a thousand board feet. So, you know, and, and again, I I don't like to prognosticate on that, but it's it's not a depressed market by any means for ash. That number is less cutting and trucking. What's that? That number is less cutting and trucking. Uh, it depends on, on where you're located. Um, no, that, that should be on the stump. They're, they're paying, paying you um, stumpage, and they're taking title to that on the stump, and that should be the price in your pocket. Yes. Yes. A couple of things. First of all, um, I, I'm on the board of Liberty Grove Town, and I am not aware of any deal whatsoever for Liberty Grove to receive any money from our bluff at 11th Street Dyke. So I'd like to debunk that rumor. But then, um, as board member, uh, if the Airport and Parks Committee, um, I guess I'm, I'm just asking you as a director to please keep us in the loop because there are rumors flying around all over the place in, in your county, and we're all concerned about your blood headlands. We're also all concerned about emerald ash borer. So um, for your meetings and stuff, please send something to our office so that we can be notified and be kept informed. Certainly. Thank you for Thank being you. here. And I did have three of my airport and park committee members here, yes, too, so that, it was yeah. great to see them uh, continually getting educated and being aware of this topic. And there's a, there's a lot to learn about emerald ash borer. So, and you guys are asking fabulous questions. Question here? Yeah, if we're going to lose the ash trees now, we've lost the elm trees, we have oak wilt disease, what do you suggest <laughs> it's safe to plant to replace everything we're losing? I'd like to have trees around my house, but I don't know what to plant. Well, I'm the wrong person to ans ask that because I can tell you, uh, you know, an insect or a disease that'll kill almost every tree out there. <laughs> so, um, Bill and Chris, what do you guys usually recommend for folks up in this area? Uh, wanna... and, and I will point out, too, that, um, Tracy, did you have a replacement trees document that some folks picked up? Yeah, they all went. They all went, okay. <laughs> there, if you didn't get one of those replacement species lists um, that Tracy had up there earlier, which would be geared towards urban type areas, um, it's available online or contact Tracy. Okay. Okay. So there, there, there would be a list of some other other species. But, you know, again, I'm the wrong person to ask because I can tell you an insect or a disease that'll kill everything out there. Yeah, she's our buzzkill. <laughs> You know, from, from an urban setting, there's tons of them out there that, you know, Bill and I don't deal with as much, and those questions are, are definitely should be directed at, at Tracy. Um, from a, a rural setting, you know, basically Bill and I are going to recommend native species. We're not going to recommend anything non-native. And while there is a, a number of species that um, can be killed by a different insect or critter out there, um, a lot of it's going to depend on, on what your soil types are and what you have growing around you. And generally, that's best off having a forester come out and take a look at your property, um, doing a walkthrough with you, and then talking about what options and recommendations would be best for your suited property. With that being said, you know Bill and I are both local here in the county. By all means, our contact info is, is up there. We left a bunch of cards. That's what we're here for. So if you guys have questions or wooded parcels that you'd like us to come take a walkthrough with you, that's, that's definitely what we're here for and that's appropriate. So um, we're more than happy to work with you and coming up with some recommendations on what species would do best on your property given ideal circumstances. Is that like a free service or? Yep, yep it, is a, it is a free service. We generally don't do yard tree type of stuff, but if you own you know, a few acres um, that's, that's wooded or more. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, we're paid for by the taxpayer's dollar, so um, you guys are paying our salary, and that's where we're here to service you as landowners. So by all means, um, pick up the phone, give us a call. Um, we're out in the field a lot, so otherwise send us an email and, and start that process, and we'd be happy to set up an appointment and come out and take a walk through with anybody that... I'd much rather be out in the field walking than in the office. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Chris. Yeah. How big do you consider the scale of this uh, problem 
on North County's, you know, the overall health of North County's Woodland. Is it unprecedented? I, uh, the EAB? Yes. Um, Linda, you want to answer that one? It's going to be on the same scale as uh, statewide. It's going to be on the same scale as Dutch elm disease um, or chestnut blight. Um, so it's it's going to basically it's going to affect the entire species. So at that point, it kind of depends on are how you, much ash. Are you talking right now though, or, or large? I mean, as we move ahead in time. Well, as this proceeds, how is it going to affect your county's woodlands overall? Is that is that a big is this a problem we've never seen before? Oh, absolutely. I mean, if you're familiar with Dutch elm disease, it's going to be along that same line. And, and different woodland owners, property owners are going to be affected very differently. If you're the landowner that has property that, you know, just has a small percentage of ash and a lot of other species that will occupy those gaps when the ash fall out, then I think you're in good shape and you may not need to do anything if you don't want to. For somebody that owns land in the, the black ash swamp, um, a lot of southern door parcels that are very heavy, to green ash and black ash, there's real problems um, in the future. And some of those questions we don't have answers for yet. Um, this is the recipe we can give you and you're gonna be successful in regenerating you know, a different suite of species there. And the ability of natural areas to, to remount, like you mentioned, black ash swamps. Yeah, and there's, there's a lot of trials going on right now um, of different species they're trying. You know, invasive species are, are a whole other animal to throw in the mix that will complicate issues of trying to regenerate some of these black ash and green ash swamps to other species, species like reed canary grass. Not to mention, if, if we do lose the green and black ash in a lot of these lowland types, um, those trees move a lot of water out of that system and we're worried about, you know, how much water will not be moved out of those systems and there's the potential to completely lose the forest ecosystem in those sites. So, um, we're going to be having to deal with those questions here now, um, and it's going to be on an individual basis, and there is no cut and dry answer for those. And I'm going to be his buzzkill again, and he said, uh, if we lose ash, I'll change that to plan. <laughs> Sorry. That's all right. Um, and on the, on the topic of, you know, what, what trees are going to come in, what can you replant, what's, what's going to be able to do well in your stand, um, although I can list insects and diseases that will kill almost every tree that we've got out there, um, many of those are dependent on the health of the stand or they are not something that's going to wipe out the species. So, you know, they're manageable. Um, and emerald ash borer just happens to be not particularly manageable and it's going to probably wipe out ash as a, as a species if, if it has its way. So, um, how are we doing on time? It's about 10 to 3. Um, how about if, are there a couple more questions and then maybe we'll go out and we'll take a look at some trees. We, I can answer more questions out there as well. Let me get you. Um, in its native range, mm -hmm. has it done the same thing to ash? I mean, what are the impacts there and, and what lessons can we take from that? Sure. In its native range, um, it acts like any of our native insects here. So like we have two-line chestnut borer that attacks um, oak that are under stress and emerald ash borer in its native range attacks ash that are under stress. And so if the trees are healthy, not a problem. Um, and, and so it's, it's just one of the native insects over there. And the ash trees just have evolved with it and they deal with it. It's not a problem. One more question. Does it make sense to save seeds from green, white, and black ash trees and send them to seed savers or that cave in Norway or somewhere? <laughs> 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 yeah, somewhere mm -hmm. down the road, we could bring ash trees back. Yep. Is there, is there any sense in saving ash seed? Um, all states that have ash have done that. They've, they've been saving seed. They've been collecting it from a variety of areas around every state. They've been um, saving that seed. And the idea is that if in the future something happens, either all of the ash is wiped out and we could bring it back, or if we do come up with some level of resistance and we need to bring in more genetics, we have that ability. So that is, that is an option and we are, we are saving seed. I did see one more question. Let me let me grab that one, then we'll go outside. Yeah. Talking about harvesting these trees, how long is that ash borer going to stay active in a tree after you cut it down and kill it? So the, the question is, when you cut a tree down and emerald ash borer is in that tree, how long is that emerald ash borer going to stay in that tree and live? Emerald ash borer, in order to infest a tree, in order to initially attack a tree, it wants a live tree. 
So once you cut it down, emerald ash borer will not reinfest that tree. But anything that is in that tree when you cut it down can complete development and emerge. So if you cut it down and leave it as a log, or if you cut it down and split it up into firewood and then let it sit, any emerald ash borer that are in there should be able to complete their development, and that may take them another year, should be able to complete their development and chew their way out as an adult, and then it's done. That's it. The, the adults will not reinfest that wood because it's now dead and they don't care about it. So it's a good question. Are we doing any research in genetics to develop an ash tree that's resistant? Are we doing any research on the genetics to develop resistant ash trees? We are. Well, we being the DNR, no. But the, the Department of Agriculture, uh, the Forest Service, they are doing a lot of research on that. They're looking at some of the species that are um, native to the area, uh, native to Asia, where uh, emerald ash borer is from. Manchurian ash is one of those species that has evolved with emerald ash borer and does seem to be somewhat resistant to emerald ash borer. We're trying to figure out if there are genes we can pluck out to put into our native species or what is the resistance um, in those particular trees. There's also some work in um, the lower peninsula of Michigan where emerald ash borer has taken out 99% of the ash and maybe there's one live ash tree left. Why is that live ash tree left? They're trying to examine those trees. So far they haven't found any true resistance, but they're looking. Um, so yeah, they are looking at genetic resistance. They are looking at how to tease out any genetic resistance and try and improve our native trees, but it's gonna take a little bit more time. So, but they're working on it. Um, yes? Thank you, thank you. Okay, um, I'm going to make my way up here and then we're gonna, I'm gonna go out and if anyone wants to see what it looks like in person, I might not be able to show you an adult beetle, but we'll walk out and we'll look at some trees so that you can see what it looks like when the trees decline. You can see what woodpecker damage looks like, at least a little bit of it, and you can see a D-shaped exit hole. So we'll head outside and take a look. Thank you, everyone. Ash is a very, very resilient tree that can have so much damage on it and still have a little bit of green up there. So it's technically dead, it just doesn't know it yet. <laughs> Let's see what we can find here. Excuse me, I sure. gotta, get, yeah, go ahead. gotta get an angle here. You gotta get those pictures so we can see them someday on TV. Yes, you just might. Once in a while that actually happens. Yeah, look at there. There you see them. Oh, wow. Those S shaped things. There it is. Did you find some? Yeah. Here's an adult. Here's a beetle that's just starting to bore its way out. You can see its head. Oh, wow. And there's that kind of D shaped exit hole with the flat. Oh, my goodness. Oh. Right, right above my this. Yep, the little beetle is in oh, there. Yep, yep. <laughs> you can see all, those little all of this damage that you see is from emerald ash borer. Wow. All of this tunneling. See it, Scout? I'm going to peel a little bit more. Just watch your fingers. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, and peel a little bit more. Oh, here we've got a larva. This little worm-like oh, okay. thing here. Ah. Not very big. Oh, yeah. But they start out small. So here's a, this is the larvae. Peel hmm. a little more. Down here that's coming out. You can see his little head. Oh, yeah. Tasty. <laughs> <laughs> yep, here's a great D-shaped exit hole. Oops, let me clear that up just a little. Because this level of damage that you're seeing here, there's no way water and food can move up that tree anymore, up that portion. 